Today's sermon is Jesus Gets Personal. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity talks about and tries to disabuse people of that common statement that, well, you know, I don't believe Jesus is all the church says he is, but I do believe he was a really good teacher. Lewis says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis continues, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. So you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But Lewis says, let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus gets personal. Our scripture for today, Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 27. Hear God's word. We're returning to this series of passages. Back to 9, 18 through 27 in Luke's gospel. And it came to pass, while he was praying in private, the disciples were with him. He asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. Then he said to them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. But he rebuked them and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, it is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and to be killed, and on the third day to be raised. And he said to all, If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a person to acquire the whole world, yet himself to destroy or forfeit? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Who is he? <laughs> Who is this? Who is Jesus? This is the question that dominates all of human history. Even if you were not a believer, if you were simply to look objectively at the turns and twists and the general flow of human history up to this point, you would say, okay, well, the question about Jesus is front and center. Identifying Jesus is what we're talking about, identifying Jesus. And then, as I said to you as we headed into Advent, the most important question for you, for your life here on earth, and for your eternity is this. Who is Jesus to me? Not just who is he out there, who is he abstractly, who is Jesus to me? Jesus gets personal. We're talking today about my own, your own identification of Jesus, round one, and then round two, my own identification with Jesus. Are, are you identified with him? 
that's the central matter of salvation. So of and with. And really, the truth is, identification leads to vocation. In other words, what's your calling? Why are you here? And what are you doing with your life? If you identify Jesus as who he actually is, and if you identify with Jesus, then that determines your priorities today, this week, as a parent, as a husband, wife, as a single person, as a grandparent, as a professional or whatever you do for a living. Who am I? Who am I seeking to be, to become? What is my life direction? It all is driven by your identification of Jesus and whether you identify with him or not. And you can do reverse engineering on this. Frankly, if your life is not about Jesus, then you do not identify with him yet. If your marriage is not primarily about Jesus, then you do not identify with him yet. If, if your priorities for your children is not about Jesus front and center, then you're not identified with Jesus yet. Jesus gets personal. <laughs> he gets really personal. Uh, Luke 9, 18 through 27, Jesus calls us to faith in him, in him, by personally and publicly confessing him as God's Christ. We've covered this in a couple previous sermons, but let's just remember this. Personally and publicly confessing him as God's Christ. Secondly, knowing and trusting in him as the Son of Man, as the Christ who is the Son of Man, whose way, by God's will, was suffering for our salvation. And thirdly, flowing from that, denying ourselves and dying to ourselves daily, following him in the way of the cross. That's last week's sermon. Now, let's go back to this identification and understand where we are in Luke's gospel, because if you're learning to read the Bible the way God inspires you to read the Bible, like what we're talking about on Wednesday nights. You're not just picking out a verse here or there randomly. You're thinking about what is the message here? What's the developing message? Luke is very clear on this. He wants us to understand that this issue, like Mark, he's different than Mark, a different approach, but similar. Who is Jesus is the big thing before us, and what are we going to do with Jesus? So Luke chapter 1 through Luke chapter 3 is round one of identifying Jesus. Uh, you get it from the angels. The angels, you know, Gabriel with his annunciation to Mary. You get it with the angels when Jesus is born, the great proclamation, the great doxologies about who Jesus is. Unto you is born today in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, the anointed one of God, Lord, Kyrios. You get it from the Holy Spirit speaking through prophets in the first three chapters of Luke's gospel. And let me ask you this, who is the first prophet by the power of the Holy Spirit who identifies Jesus as who he is? Anybody remember? There hasn't been a prophet speaking by the Spirit in 400 or more years in Israel, and now all of a sudden one does, and who is it? It's one that we would say could be aborted. It's a fetus named John in his mother, Elizabeth. You remember this? He leaps in the womb identifying who Jesus is, and Elizabeth picks up on this and says, hey, the baby within me by the power of the Holy Spirit has identified that you are bearing the promised incarnate Son of God. And then it goes on to um, 40 days after Jesus is born, the dedication in the temple, the old prophets, Simeon and Anna, each separately identify exactly who Jesus is. Back to the temple, before we're out of chapter two of Luke, back to the temple, 12 years later, Jesus at 12 identifies himself. The first words that we have chronologically of Jesus in all the gospels, Luke chapter two, Jesus at 12, and catch this, Luke chapter two, verse 49, 
he said to them, to his parents who've been freaking out, who don't know where he is, they headed back to Nazareth, they've had to come back, they've been searching for three days, and he said to them, why were you seeking me or searching for me? Did you not know that, I want you to pay attention to this, I'll come back to this, day in, in the biblical Greek, D in modern Greek, that little term there, it's a big term, it means it is necessary. Okay? Must. It is necessary. For me to be in my Father's house. So the first words Jesus speaks that we have in recorded in the Bible, Jesus is centering everything around what is necessary according to the Father's word and will. We'll come back to that. Then we also get, when Jesus comes forward to be baptized by John, the baptizer, the Holy Spirit testifies, confesses who Jesus is and the heavenly voice, in other words, the Father, at the baptism. But the Father speaks it to the Son very personally. You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. We'll come back to the Transfiguration next week. The Father is going to say it to Peter, James, and John. And before we're even out of Luke chapter 3, again, the genealogy, going all the way back, the way Luke gives it, going you know, all the way back to the beginning, uh, son of Anash, son of Seth, son of Adam, the son of God. Closing the genealogy at the close of Luke chapter 3. Now, we've been for months and months in the adult public ministry of Jesus, beginning at Luke chapter 4 and moving forward to where we are in Luke chapter 9. Now, let's just pick up some of the identifications that we've had. The devil in testing Jesus. If you are the son of God, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, Jesus' own words and deeds identifying who he is as the Son of God with full authority over demons, over death, over everything. The demons' horror. They identify Jesus with horror. We know who you are, the Holy One of God. What do you have to do with us? Get out of here. You're not going to like curse us now, are you? You're not going to condemn us now. Remember this? Demons are identifying Jesus. Jesus shuts them up because Jesus is not interested in testimony from hell. He wants your testimony. He wants your public confession about who he is. We've got the leader's rejection of Jesus. He's a blasphemer. He's a false prophet. He's not a prophet. We've got the crowd speculation. Are you interested in polls? You like to follow polls? Cable news likes to follow polls. There's all kinds of opinions about Jesus running around with all the crowds. We're going to come next week to the ultimate climax of Luke chapters 4 through 9 uh, with God's own revelation of his kingdom in Jesus at what is typically called the transfiguration. That's what that last verse that we read today is about. Some of you, Jesus says, will not taste death until you see the revelation of the kingdom of God. Well, Peter, James, and John are going to see it in person, live, and in all its glory on the mountain. God's confession of Jesus as God's son and God's chosen, that's going to happen next time. We'll get to that next week. And God's command to the disciples to hear and obey Jesus. But today, we're not at the ultimate climax of this. We're at the penultimate climax in this Luke chapters 4 through 9. The disciples' confession of Jesus as God's Christ. So Jesus asked, you'll remember, who do the crowd say I am? What's the latest polling? Most politicians stop at the latest polling, right? Jesus does not. He gets really personal and then says, but who do you? say I am. It's plural. The you is plural. Who do y'all say I am? Peter takes the lead and says, the Christ of God. Now, this is the, the term in the New Testament Greek, Christos, it translates from the Mashiach of Hebrew, which means the anointed one. But that's not specific because Israel at various times. Oh, in, in Matthew, we also get that Simon Peter says, the son of the living God. But again, those terms are a little bit open. 
I mean, Israel is called the son of God. You've got all kinds of kings who are the anointed of God at various times. You've got even Cyrus, the Persian emperor, who at one point is called in Isaiah, the anointed of God. So what does this mean, the anointed of God? Is Jesus uh, just another in the line of uh, maybe this generation's anointed king, this generation's anointed deliverer, or is he the the Messiah of all history. This kind of begs the application question for you and me. Is Jesus for me my version of Jesus or God's version? This is really what we're talking about today. Is it my Jesus, the one that I draw? He's kind of sweet, he's kind of cute, or maybe he's tough, I don't know. What, what, what kind of Jesus do you project? <laughs> Or is he God's Jesus, God's Christ? Who is God's Christ? How does he bring justice? This is the open question when you, you head into the New Testament. How's it going to play out with Jesus? You know, most Jews at the time of Jesus, and presumably possibly even Simon Peter himself, when he's making this great declaration about Jesus, he wants Jesus to be kind of the religious version of a Marvel superhero. Bring it on. Wipe out the bad people. Get rid of the infidel. Get rid of the pagan Romans and bring in the glory of Zion and we'll be all there in the parade. Is that how the story plays out? Some of you have read ahead. You're ahead of me in Luke chapter 9, yes? Is he the military warrior hero who comes on the white war horse? Yes! Or is he God's suffering servant, the son of man who will judge out of the righteousness of his own suffering? Is he the rejected redeemer? Anybody read ahead in this story? You know how this is going to go? Is he possibly somebody who comes riding not on a war horse into Jerusalem, but a donkey? Anybody know how this story goes? Does he carry not a sword into his battle with sin and evil, but a cross? Oh, that kind of Christ. That's not the one I would have pictured. Yeah. How's he going to go into battle and justify us and save us? Luke 9, 18 through 27, Jesus calls us to believe in him by personally and publicly confessing him, him, as the Christ of God. Let's pause and remember Simon Peter, our good friend. Uh, fast forward the story. I will fast forward the story on this one. Luke 22, verse 57, in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest. How's, Je how's Peter's confession doing around now? Jesus has been arrested. Everything is upside down. How is our good confessor holding up? Servant girl comes up to Peter. He denies knowing Jesus, saying, Woman, I do not know him. How's your confession this week? Paul in 1 Timothy says, flee false doctrine, flee controversies, flee discontentment. A lot of people get discontented about things. And flee definitely from the love of money, which is the root of all kinds of evil, Paul says. Don't go with the ways of the crowd in the world. He says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Stick with Jesus. Stick with your confession. Take hold of the eternal salvation which God gives you in the true confession of Jesus Christ. So back to our story. Rewind the tape. Peter says the Christ of God. And now we know, even without what Matthew adds to it, that when Jesus starts talking about the cross and dying, Peter rebukes Jesus. But we can understand why Luke, Luke wants us to focus in on just the identity of Jesus, but he gives us the rebuke there. All 11 other times this verb is translated in Luke, it means rebuke. So it's not just what the ESV says, warns them sternly, it's rebuke. He rebukes the wind, he re everything else is rebuke, okay? 
Jesus rebukes them. This is like disciplinary teaching, like a parent is supposed to do with a child. No, no, no. You need to head this way, not that way. He rebukes and commands them to tell this to no one, saying, it is necessary. Yes, I'm going to come back to that. I've already, had, I've already highlighted that for you. It is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders, chief priests, scribes, and to be killed and on the third day be raised. So again, let me just give you the big picture and I'll get into the deep a little bit. Jesus calls you personally and publicly to confess him, him as the Christ, to trust in him even when things go haywire in your life and you're confused. Even when, I thought when I signed up for Jesus, everything is going to be great and I, all I have to do is pray and all the cancer is taken away or all the, stick with him. Trust in him whose way by God's word and will was suffering, being rejected, being killed, being raised. Now, here it is, 922. You see it there? Day. See it? Same thing we saw back when Jesus is 12 years old in the temple. Okay, It means it is necessary. This must happen by the Father's word and will. Okay, Jesus says it is necessary. Just like he said, it is necessary for me to be in my Father's house. Now he's telling them as he's teaching them what it means for him to be the Christ and for us to follow him as the Christ. It is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things. Theologically, the Son's active obedience here. Active obedience here. To be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes. Pause. Catch this. Those are the three categories from which the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, are drawn. Elders, chief priests, scribes. Jesus is already prophesying, I'm going to go before the Sanhedrin, and they're going to condemn me. He just told you that. Also, to be killed. Notice this, this is passive under human action. What do we as human beings do to Jesus? We kill him. But I have good news because we've got another passive coming up. Killed by human evil action and on the third day be raised by God's action. Who has the final word? God the Father. God's holy saving action will raise Jesus from the dead. So, this is the first this is the first in Luke's gospel of Jesus' direct prophecies of his passion. We're going to get later ones in this chapter in Luke 9, 44, in Luke 17, 25, and in Luke 18, 31 through 33. And there's some other also rumbling prophecies from Jesus as well. So let's get back to you and me in our faith. Which person is the Lord of my faith? Am I following a crowd? Well, most Christians seem now to think this. Am I following a guru? I really like her podcast. I really like his TV show. Man, he, he, that's, a, that's a real spiritual leader. Uh, yeah, maybe not. Do you know him? Maybe it's a significant other. Hey, to keep my relationship with my children okay, I've got to kind of cave on this. Hey, my, my, my spouse tells me this. Who is the Lord of your faith? Or is it Jesus? I want to invite you to kneel before Jesus, him alone. Don't cave to your own fears, your own likes. Go to God's Christ, the crucified and risen Son of Man. Is it my version of Christianity? I hope not. God forbid, may it be his version of Christianity, the crucified and risen Christ. And this applies, hey, teenagers, but also big, older people, like people who are middle-aged and people who are old as the hills like I am. Look, what you do with your body is part of your confession of faith. Let me make this clear. It's not just a word deal. It's what I am doing with my body has to do with my confession of faith. What I'm doing with my time, what I'm doing with my relationships, what I am doing with my choices this week 
is a confession of where my faith is. Okay? So back to the body thing. Drugs, sex, all that kind of stuff, and also just kind of how I direct my body, right? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. How I use my body reveals what I actually believe. How I use my time, how I use my money, and yes, how I run my mouth when I'm not at church reflects what I actually believe and who my God, who my Lord is. Paul talks about people whose God is their bellies. You know anybody whose God is their belly? <laughs> He means that not just about food. He means that about a bunch of things. So here's the call. Jesus calls you, and I want to invite you to confess him personally and publicly, both ways. Confess him as God's Christ. Know and trust him as the crucified son of man, no matter what is going on, no matter how confused we get and denying and dying to ourselves and following him in the way of the cross. We talked about it last week. Let me remind you of the paradox. Perishing versus paradise. Good life now versus glory everlasting. If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up your cross, your cross, and follow him. You try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for him, it's yours forever. So Jesus does get personal. He calls us to this confession. And I have good news. He's already gone the way before you. You know what? We're all going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death sooner or later. And the stars and the pretty people of this world are not going to be there for you. And you'll be going all alone. But you don't have to because you can follow him in the path that he has forged for you. And he will be with you all the way through because he has taken the cross ahead of you, the cross that saves you and through which you are given life. Go with him. I mean, really confess him. Really go with him. So uh, back to 1 Timothy from Paul. Paul says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Stay with that confession when times get hard. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his own testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstayed and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's gone there before you, Christian. In front of Pontius Pilate, he made the confession and made the choice to save your soul. Now hold on to his hand and live with him. That's the Christ. That's the Savior. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.